Good morning, and welcome to the Northwestern Michigan College International Affairs Forum. Morning edition. <laughs> My name is Jim Bensley, and I direct the IAF here at NMC. We're glad to have this great audience of students, IAF members, people from the community, and those of you tuning in from across the US, Canada, and even overseas. Before we begin today's program, I'd like to mention the fact that the IAF sponsored Academic World Quest will be celebrating its 10, 10 year anniversary a week from today with an exciting high school competition taking place at the NMC Haggerty Center. We invite all of you to come out and witness which four person team will be making a trip to Washington DC in April to compete in the national event. To help the students afford the trip, we placed a donation pail just outside the auditorium. All money raised goes directly to the cost of sending the team to the nation's capital. And, and I hope that you would uh, consider donating to, to make that uh, a really memorable experience for these students. It has been in the past and no doubt will be this year as well. And now I'd like to ask Julie Doyle to join me on stage. Julie's been the key to making AWQ happen for the past six years. Her dedication to working tirelessly with area schools, coaches, and students to prepare them for competition is beyond reproach. Without her, I can honestly say the reputation of AWQ in Northern Michigan would be nowhere near what it is today. Thank you, Julie, for your continuing efforts to support the critical understanding of geopolitical issues for students in Northern Michigan. I'd like to present Julie <laughs> with a small token of our appreciation for her work over all of these years. And I would ask you to please give up a round of applause for the excellent work she's done during her time as AWQ. Oh. All right, and now for today's program. With me on stage is our moderator commentator, Mr. Claudio mm -hmm. Lillenfeld, a senior foreign policy and corporate diplomacy professional with experience in life sciences, global health, information technology, trade, and national security. His career experiences <clears throat> include 20 years overseeing work in Asia with a particular focus on India, spanning US government, national security, and trade policy and the private sector both in-house and as a consultant. During his 20 years in the US government, Claudio served as the deputy assistant and acting assistant US trade representative for South and Central Asia from 2006 to 2010, leading trade negotiations with India and the region. Prior to that, he led South Asia's policy in the office of Secretary of Defense from 1999 to 2006 including leading the Defense Department's catalytic work, building a new and transformed strategic and security relationship with India. Mr. Lillenfeld is currently a fellow at Harvard's Law, Harvard Law School's Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, serving as co-chair of the Project on Voluntary Licensing and Access to Medicines. He also holds an MA in International Relations from the University of Chicago. And zooming in live from New Delhi is Dr. Brahma Chalani, a specialist in international security and arms control issues, Professor Cellini has held appointments at Harvard, the Brookings Institute, the School of Advanced International Studies at the Johns Hopkins University, and the Australian National University. He's the author of nine books and has served as a member of the policy advisory group headed by the Foreign Minister of India. Until 2000, he was an advisor to India's National Security Council, serving as convener of the External Security Group of the National Security Advisory Board. Professor Chalani is a frequent contributor to public conversations about international security on television and in print. Professor Chalani is a frequent contributor to public conversations about international security on television and in print. He writes opinion pieces for the International Herald Tribune, the Wall Street Journal, the Japan Times, the Economic Times, and the Times of India. Professor Chalani holds a PhD in International Studies from Nehru University. Now, a quick reminder before we begin, both our in-person audience and those of you tuning in virtually will have a chance to ask questions of our guests. Please raise your hand, or for those of you online, enter questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And of course, please silence your phones. Claudio, 
The stage is yours. Thank you. Brahma, good to see you. Good uh, to see you, Claudio. Uh, we've crossed paths many times over the years. Uh, our, Jim, thank you so much for the invitation to be here, folks. Uh, it's really nice to come out and talk to a crowd uh, that's interested in hearing about India. Uh, I spent half of my career not knowing much at all about India, which meant I spent a significant part of my life uh, not knowing much about India and fell into uh, working on India policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense starting in 1999. And I feel like the demystification process that I experienced is something that I really love to share with others uh, because uh, India really matters and, uh, and it's a consequential country. But for most of us, India is on the other side of the world and we still read about you know, issues related to India that relate as much about poverty and chaos as the, it does about all the things, the other things that India represents, you know, both culturally and uh, economically and the vast growth that India has experienced over the last 20 years. And for me, one of the things that the lens that I viewed through which I viewed India uh, was from the US strategic interests perspective. I was working in the Defense Department and I cared a lot about this from graduate school onward. And India was an obvious uh, lost opportunity for US over the decades since India's independence in the 40s. And we had had some positive moments during that time, but uh, an author who wrote a book called The Strange Democracies pretty much put it best in that title. Uh, that there was a lot more potential than there was actual. Uh, and one of the things that uh, that I was able to enjoy be because of the transformation in American strategic thinking and, and policy makers thinking about India that happened around the time that I started working on India policy is the fact that India really looms as a, as a, as a pretty major uh, area of interest for the U.S. and should. Um, and I think of sort of three key reasons. And one is that India is a democracy and it is a very large and vibrant democracy. Uh, and it is a very large country uh, with <clears throat> oh, now nearing one and a half billion population. Uh, there's recent press about India may have actually surpassed China's population at this point. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, shared strategic challenges. Our top strategic challenges, security challenge today is uh, China, uh, and it is the same for India. And uh, uh, lastly, we have a sizable Indian diaspora in the U.S., and we uh, share a language, at least among many Indians, uh, in, uh, particularly the educated uh, uh, in the policy community and in the business community, uh, English is the lingua franca. So there, there are lots of fundamentals at stake, uh, not the least of which is also that if you look at the continent of Asia, there are three major powers on the continent, and that's Russia, China, and India. And there's obviously one that doesn't fit the paradigm that the other two do, which is that we've either had or been threatened with conflict with Russia and China, but for the most part with India, uh, because of these shared uh, fundamentals, uh, we really have uh, some uh, commonality and a real reason for the U.S. to have a very, very strong relationship with India. Anyhow, that's a little bit of the background for me. We're really fortunate to have Brahma uh, with us today. Uh, I wasn't the one who invited him to join. I'm an invitee along with Brahma, but very happy to see that he's on here because he's an incredibly keen observer of uh, sort of global strategic issues, obviously particularly focused on the broader Asian context and Indo-Pacific uh, and he also is somebody who doesn't hold back, um, uh, is a very strong writer and commentator. So I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to the, the 
the discussion with Brahma now and let him lead the way. And Brahma, we, we chatted a bit in advance, so I hope I'm not um, shocking you too much with some of the questions I'm gonna be asking you. But I thought I would start with China. Uh, and uh, you know, you've written a lot about China, as I mentioned, and uh, you know, the context with, with, within which both India and the US operate now. China is a, the biggest security challenge that we face. Um, and I'd be interested in understanding uh, and helping the audience understand better um, how you think we should think about India's situation and approach with respect to China and the China challenge. And as a subset of that, if you have the opportunity to do so, I'd also be really interested, not just in the direct challenge that China faces, that China poses for India, but the many indirect challenges that China is creating on India's periphery directly with the string of pearls, uh, relationships around India, as well as even in a continent like Africa where Chinese, China's making major inroads and <clears throat> it has a historic, uh, has historic ties with uh, Africa, both in terms of diaspora as well as uh, commerce and such. So over to you, Brahma, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Claudio. Right now, China and India have been locked in military standoff along the long Himalayan frontier. And, and that standoff is now 33 months old and it's continuing with, um, with something like 100,000 troops on, on either side, you know, with many of them positioned in, 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 in eyeball to eyeball confrontation. But the maritime challenge and the string of pearls um, strategy of China is an additional factor um, but one, one aspect that really stands out is that through its aggressive revisionism, China has set in motion trends in its neighborhood or in the wider world that seem unfavorable to China's own long-term interests. We have seen how China has compelled Australia to abandon hedging and enter into the AUKUS alliance with the US and Britain or how China has compelled Japan to announce that it's going to be doubling its defense spending and in a way turning its back on, on, on the pacifist policy that Japan has pursued since the end of World War II. In a similar way, China is turning India into its permanent enemy. China is driving India closer to the US and triggering a major Indian military buildup. And India, because of its size, is one part that can frustrate China's goal of becoming the unchallenged power in Asia. Of course, there is a power asymmetry between China and India. China's economic and military power is much, much greater than India's. But it's important to bear in mind that while China is a revisionist power, India is a status quo power with a defense-oriented military strategy. And defense generally has advantage over offense because it's easier to protect and hold than to advance and seize. And India has, despite the power asymmetry with China, India has one of the world's largest and most experienced mountain warfare armies. So clearly, uh, given what China is doing, uh, it, it, is, it is not in China's own interest to make an enemy of India. And yet this is precisely what it is doing. Thank you, Brahma. Can you comment a little bit about uh, the Indian participation in the Quad in this context? Uh, for those who are less familiar, actually, if you would like, you're welcome to talk a little bit about the Quad and I can add to that as well. Um, just to mention about how that came together and particularly from India's perspective? Well, the Quad um, was revived after a decade-long dormancy by President Trump. And President Trump was clear that the Quad could uh, be a very useful means to deal with the maritime challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. But then we have seen in, in the last um, year that the Russian 
invasion of Ukraine has changed global geopolitics and the new Cold War with Russia is, um, is forcing President Biden to pursue a more conciliatory approach toward China. And this has implications for the Quad and the Quad's agenda because the Quad's agenda is largely driven by the United States. President Biden has been quick to support anti-government protests in countries like Iran and Myanmar, but it speaks for itself that President Biden didn't utter a word on the large-scale anti-regime protests in China that forced Xi Jinping recently to ease his zero COVID policy. So this underscores the more conciliatory approach toward China that uh, is being that is, you know, that is being driven by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in turn, we are seeing that under President Biden, the Quad agenda, the Quad agenda is becoming less focused on the security challenges of the Indo-Pacific and, and, and in fact, more focused on global challenges, global challenges like climate change, global health security, cybersecurity, and resilient supply chains. But the Quad is a small group, a group of just four countries. And the Quad is in no position to deal with global challenges. And I think that, that the fact that this Quad security agenda is taking a back seat is, is not is good news for China, but it's really bad news for, for the Quad's um, uh, Future, it's you know, it's a, it's it's vitality. It's it's uh, it's important for the Quad to shift its focus back to the security challenges in the Indo-Pacific because the Indo-Pacific will decide the new global order, and and the and the challenges in in the Indo-Pacific are only growing. And Taiwan, the threat against Taiwan is actually increasing, uh, and and there's a danger. That, um, that an emboldened Xi Jinping might move on, the, move on Taiwan in the next couple of years. And, and the global impact from a potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan would be far greater than the fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Just for clarification, for those who aren't aware, uh, the Quad is a uh, loose organizational structure that Japan, the US, Australia, and India have uh, entered into. And uh, they had their first uh, summit of actual leaders uh, early in the Biden administration. And it's been uh, uh, pushed by concerns about China from all four of these countries and the desire to sort of have collaboration among the, the leading democratic powers and in, in the broader Indo-Pacific region. And I, I think one of, one observation I would make is that I think, uh, and I think India, watching India uh, deal with China, there are some of the same instincts, I think, Brahma, that you mentioned uh, are, uh, that you think are afflicting sort of US perspective on the, the Quad's agenda, I think, India and its own bilateral relations, US and its bilateral relations with China, and obviously the Quad is a manifestation of that, I think always struggle with how far to go with the, with the conflictual side of things, the, the, the pushing the strategic collaboration, as you might say in the narrative, uh, dealing with the security threat that China poses versus trying to avoid uh, uh, sort of sowing the seeds for further and potential conflict. Uh, and and uh, we see both India policy and US policy trying to nuance and balancing those things out, uh, recognizing, for example, that the threat to Taiwan is significant. And the US has obviously done quite a few things in that regard. Um, and the US and India are collaborating, including some of our private sector companies to uh, you know, reduce some of the threat that the Chinese threat on Taiwan might pose. But anyway, thank you for your for your perspective on that. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to flip to uh, talking briefly about uh, India's domestic politics. It's 
always fraught for an American observer to be pointing fingers at developments in India uh, because, you know, not only do we live in a glass house, but it's, it's an irritant in, in, in the relationship when, when Americans uh, and American organizations uh, make declarations about what's happening in India with respect to human rights or democratic processes and such. Um, and so this question isn't really intended to come from that angle uh, more. I think it is helpful to uh, get an understanding from, from uh, an Indian strategic thought leader on how, how we ought to be thinking about the way India's democracy is evolving, the, the incredible strength of Prime Minister Modi and the BJP in national politics, uh, how that relates to uh, power at the, the federated, the state's level, uh, and, and how we should think about issues such as treatment of the press. I mean, the, the BBC, the, 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 uh, the BBC film on Prime Minister Modi and the Gujarat uh, riots from 20 years ago, obviously has been making the news here in the US, um, and then, uh, and treatment of Muslims and such. What it, how should we be thinking about that here? Well, if you look at it uh, broadly, um, India, like the US, is a very bitterly polarized democracy. And like in the US, rival political forces in India are self-segregated into their own ideological silos. Tolerance for opposing views is now in short supply in India. And the political divide the political divide is, is actually widening um, in India. And just like President Trump, um, Prime Minister Modi has faced accusations from critics uh, that you know he's um, a demagogue, a demagogue um, or you know he, that he's been pursuing divisive policies, that he's been displaying an authoritarian streak, and that he's choosing populism over constitutionalism. But such allegations are to some extent based on exaggerations and reflect the bitterly polarized politics. When President Trump was in office, he was accused of undermining American democracy. Yeah, mainstream American media called Trump an autocrat or a would-be autocrat who created, who created power with personal property. But just as American democracy survived Trump's presidency, Indian democracy is robust enough to survive Modi. But it's worth noting that Modi's approval ratings at home remain high. In fact, they're probably the highest than any democratic leader in the world currently. But in a little more than a year from now, Modi will face national elections. And even Modi's worst critics admit that Indian elections remain free and fair. So we will know in, in about um, 14 months from now whether Modi will get a fresh term in office. Going back a little bit to India's foreign policy interests, you know, one of the things that I, I find relatively remarkable, and we have hiccups is, you know, working in the system I, I saw this certainly, and we see this today, uh, where there may be differences over Russia, Ukraine, or treatment of Pakistan and such. Uh, but I think it's rather remarkable, uh, and I tend to view things through a pretty rosy-hued prism, but that the US and India as a general matter don't get caught as much in the trap of one perceiving itself as needing the other more than vice versa. That we've had problems, and I worked on policy with respect to Pakistan as well as India, where I was, as an observer and watching the debates internally, including with my own colleagues in the government when I was in government, um, I was always shocked at how the US acted as if it needed Pakistan more than Pakistan needed the US. And as a result, 
the relationship was distorted as a result of that. And the India relationship I see is much more balanced. Um, but I'd be interested uh, to get your perspective and hear about what you think about how the US and India are managing differences, um, including over uh, Russia, Ukraine, or Pakistan, uh, and, and any other issues that you would want to call attention to. Well, I think that's a good description of, um, of you know, of, um, of the fact that the US and India not only have converging strategic interests, they also have some important uh, differences on issues. And Ukraine was certainly one issue where India was not willing to um, join the Western camp um, because strategic autonomy has been integral to India's foreign policy doctrine. And initially the Biden administration sought to pressure India to abandon its neutrality in this new Cold War between Russia and, and the Western bloc. But after months of trying, the White House realized that India cannot be moved. In fact, much of the world, uh, if you look at the, you know, the global population, two thirds of the global population uh, is staying neutral in this, in this uh, conflict. And India is, in fact, all the major non-Western democracies, and India is just one example or, you know, of, of such a democracy, but even other democracies in, in outside the Western world, like South Africa, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, and even America's close allies like, like Israel and Turkey have chosen a path of neutrality in this conflict between Russia and, and NATO over Ukraine. And um, so I think the Biden administration realized after a few months that, um, that they cannot move India to shed its neutrality uh, in the current conflict. And, 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 and very wisely, Washington has, um, has decided to, to you know, not let that issue interfere with the broader relationship. The fact is that the strategic partnership between the US and India is critical to power equilibrium in Asia and the wider, and the wider Indo-Pacific region including to forestall Chinese hegemony. And with US policy compelling Russia to increasingly pivot to China, America's relationship with India has become more pivotal to US strategic interests. But, but, but there are you know, these other issues. You know, one, one disagreement uh, is of course about um, US policy toward Pakistan. Uh, President Biden has resumed uh, the U.S. coddling of Pakistan, um, and 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 certainly, in fact, uh, just when just you know just when uh, Pakistan received uh, approval uh, for a bailout from the IMF, uh, just days later, the Biden administration announced a major uh, deal with um, Pakistan to upgrade its F-16 fleet. Pakistan's F-16 fleet is aimed at India. In fact, uh, the F-16s uh, in the Pakistani arsenal uh, are also, they play a double role as, uh, as potential nuclear carriers, as, as carriers of nuclear weapons. And, and the only uh, target for uh, nuclear delivery is, is India. So uh, such irritants um, do, um, do crop up every now and then. And then there is this um, then there is this issue of U.S. sanctions policy, sanctions that target India's other neighbors like Myanmar and Iran. Um, and 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 when you know when 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 the U.S. sanctions Myanmar or Iran, it complicates India's diplomacy. It also affects India's uh, strategic interests. For example, uh, sanctions on Myanmar affect India's. Act East policy. India is trying to integrate more with with its country, with the countries in uh, that lie to its east, the countries of Southeast Asia, the countries of East Asia, and Myanmar is India's corridor to Southeast Asia. So, 
the US sanctions policy of seeking to isolate Myanmar directly affects India's interests. And similarly, the US sanctions on Iran affect India's energy interests because they drive Iran closer to China. China has become the main buyer of Iranian oil and it's buying Iranian oil at a huge discount. While India was forced by US sanctions to halt all imports of, um, of oil and gas from Iran. So India is paying a price in a way for complying with US sanctions while America's main rival, China, is benefiting from sanctions, whether it's Iran or Myanmar. So there are these issues, but I think overall, the relationship between the US and India is, is, is progressing well. And uh, President Biden has maintained the momentum in the relationship. Um, in fact, his own personal equation with Prime Minister Modi is, uh, is pretty good. They have, a, they, have an easy, they have an easy and warm rapport and um, Biden recognizes uh, India's centrality in the Asian uh, balance of power. Thank you, Brahma. You know, my own uh, additional observations would be that I think, uh, you know, Myanmar is just a really tough case. And I think it's, uh, and from what I've seen is it's, it's really difficult for uh, the Indian government to know exactly how to proceed with, uh, with what's been going on there. The rest of Southeast Asia, I think we have fewer, fewer differences. And we obviously are very encouraging the U.S., seems to be very encouraging of India's expanded engagements with the Look East policy. Um, you know, uh, Pakistan, of course, is a perennial burr in the saddle. Uh, and uh, the good thing about at least Iran is that uh, with the, you're, you're less dependent if you continue your relationship with the Russians the way you are. I mean, I don't know if that's an ironic uh, reality there. Uh, and it's interesting to see what's happening in Iran right now with the uh, with uh, the demonstrations and 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 some of the uh, you know potential for political change there. I don't know whether there's any room for optimism, but uh, that that would obviously be in our common interests. Uh, you know, I, I think I know we have about five minutes left. I'd like to give you a chance to talk a little bit about some work that you've done. Uh, pretty significantly uh, in the area of water and the challenges uh, that India faces in the broader Asia context and of course the broader Asian uh, uh, context and the sources of fresh water being a potential uh, source of friction and conflict and uh, yet another area where China is uh, putting the screws to its neighbors uh, you've done a lot of work in this area. It would be wonderful to get an update from you on your latest thinking there, because I think some of your most extensive writings were in the mid to uh, 2010s and early 2010s. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the latest in this arena? Well, the latest uh, in this uh, field is the fact that uh, China continues uh, to be on a dam building frenzy. Uh, it has it has more large dams than the rest of the world combined. Uh, you know, one country uh, has more large dams than the rest of the world. Uh, and, and in fact, um, the, the internal rivers of China are all dam saturated. Some of the big rivers in China are dying. A large numbers of lakes have disappeared in China because of over damming of rivers. So what Chinese uh, dam builders have been doing in, in the past uh, decade or so is to, is to turn the attention to international rivers, the rivers that originate on the Tibetan plateau and flow to other countries. For example, the Mekong that flows to Southeast Asia, the rivers that flow to South Asia, like the Brahmaputra, the Indus, the Ganges. So, the dam building program of China has actually um, moved to the Tibetan Plateau and has increasingly targeted international rivers. And this is creating problems between China and its um, downstream neighbors, including very friendly countries in Southeast Asia, 
uh, you know, friends of China like Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, uh, they're all complaining about the fact that the overdamming of the Mekong is, um, is affecting water flows. It's affecting, it's in fact um, causing recurrent droughts in the, in the downstream basin because when you overdam, you, you change the river system's uh, ecology. And, and water is such a critical resource. It's, you know, it's, a, it's critical to economic development. It's, you know, it sustains uh, lives and livelihoods. It's critical to, to, uh, you know, to those that are engaged in, in fishing. Uh, so when, when flows become less um, dependable, uh, they become, you know, when they, when they become erratic, it affects, it affects those who live in downstream. Brahma, are you already seeing an effect in India with the Brahmaputra, or is that a future, uh, a, a future prospect? And is it something that you worry that the Chinese will be able to uh, use as a extortion device? In relation to the Brahmaputra, the impact on India, we're not seeing it now uh, because uh, right now the, the Chinese damming has been uh, in the upper stretches of the Brahmaputra. And uh, the dams so far have been either small or moderate uh, size dams. But China has this plan to build a huge dam uh, which will be three times bigger than the Three Gorges Dam. The Three Gorges Dam is the world's largest dam. Uh, but this huge uh, dam is going to come up just before the Brahmaputra enters India. This is where the Brahmaputra creates the world's largest canyon. And the canyon is a magnet for China's dam builders. So when that massive dam comes up, it will certainly uh, have a major impact on northeastern India uh, and on Bangladesh. Bangladesh is located furthest downstream on the Brahmaputra. So the impact will, the, the greatest impact will be felt by, uh, by Bangladesh. And, and the other issue is that, you know, that China does not believe in the concept of water sharing. It, it doesn't have a water sharing treaty with any of its neighbors. It has 12 countries located downstream to it on international rivers, but it does not have a single water sharing treaty with any of its neighbors. And, and that's very unfortunate because um, water treaties are essential to build institutionalized collaboration and to promote um, good practices uh, that can help, uh, that can help uh, preserve the ecology. Thank you, Brahma. Uh, should we turn to uh, Q and A? Yeah, I think it's time to go to our audience and Brahma, ask for some so questions. Much for all that. So uh, we'll take uh, the first question from the in-person audience, and then uh, we'll choose one from our virtual audience. Good afternoon. My name is Abedin. Basically, I am from Bangladesh, and I am living in Traverse City for a few months. I had to flee Bangladesh because of my political opposition of the current regime in Bangladesh. It's wonderful to hear the expert from New Delhi about the democracy. I have two questions to uh, the expert from New Delhi. Uh, number one, recent BBC documentary revealed that Narendra Modi was involved in the killing of the 2000 minorities in Gujarat when he was the chief minister and three people one was the Mr. Hiran Pandey, the Indian Home Minister of Gujarat, have been killed, who have been given independent witness to, a, uh, to the prosecutors. And two other officials, one Mr. Singh, uh, who was the police uh, uh, detective officer, and another was an IAS officer, I forgot the name, they have been jailed. So that nobody can tell that why that Mr. Modi was involved in the riot. That is my first question. I, I want to have the comment from the expert. Number two, uh, Indian democracy is a vibrant, no doubt about it. Still, there is a 
good practice of uh, democracy. But as per Freedom House, Indian democracy is decreasing. In 2010, it was 86. Now it is 66 score as per the uh, democracy house. And the economist reported that Indian press freedom has gone down now 150 out of 190 countries. So you have correctly mentioned, in my opinion, that Indian democracy is polarized. But the experts like Nobel laureate Amartya Sen and the famous journalist, the, the former Hindu chief editor, Mr. Ramachandran uh, Narshiman Ram, has commented that if the next, next election is such polarized and communal activity is going there, Indian democracy will be like Russian democracy. And again, I'm, um, in, as my country, you mentioned about the water sharing, India never shared the legitimate water share to Bangladesh over Ganges and the Tista barrage. And United States and the democratic world trying to have a good election in Bangladesh, but India is supporting the undemocratic and autocratic regime in Bangladesh. And the 90% of the people of Bangladesh is supporting the democratic world led by United States to have a good election in Bangladesh. And my uh, question, what is your comment, the, uh, Mr. Chalani, about my observation? Uh, thank you very much. Okay, a lot to unpack there. Uh, Brahma, if you wanna take that? Well, uh, that's not one question, but at least um, eight or nine questions. <laughs> um, first, um, no democracy is perfect. As uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken said about a year and a half ago in reference to the US and India, uh, both of our democracies, he said, are works in progress. In fact, all democracies are works in progress. As far as the Gujarat riots are concerned, riots of you know, more than two decades ago, the Supreme Court of India and judiciary in India is very independent. The Supreme Court of India examined that issue thoroughly and found that the then chief minister, Modi, he was the head of the state, you know, the equivalent of a governor, of a US state, that the chief minister Modi had no role whatsoever in those riots. Uh, Modi had been accused by his critics of uh, not employing security forces uh, in time to quell the rioting. But the Supreme Court of India found that, that, that there is no evidence to indicate that uh, chief minister Modi had done anything uh, you know, that would um, make him culpable in, in, that, in, in those riots. On the issue of Bangladesh and India, uh, India has a water sharing treaty on the Ganges with Bangladesh, which sets a new principle in international water law. Uh, under this Ganges water sharing treaty, India has reserved for Bangladesh a fixed quantity of water in the dry season. In the dry season, Bangladesh has been assured that irrespective of what India gets, Bangladesh will, guess, will get a fixed quantity. This is a new principle in international water law. And Bangladesh and India have both been satisfied with that treaty and that treaty has been in place for, for a number of years. Okay, thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. Do we have any students out there that would like to ask a question before we tee one up with our right over here? Then we'll go to one of our virtual questions. How do you sus expect the droughts in India to affect the future population of India? Like, like how will the droughts affect the future population in India? Will it like, do you think it will decrease the population like to, an extreme amount. Occasionally, you know, this is uh, there's a pattern of flooding and droughts um, um, that um, a country, large country like India, faces because India is is is, is a large country uh, geographically, and um, 
some uh, some part of India may face a drought at any time, but the cycle of flooding, for example, flooding happens every year during the monsoon season, but, but India has not faced any major drought in a long, long time. Uh, for decades, I think, uh, India has not faced a major drought. Uh, and certainly India has not faced a drought of the kind that parts of the US have faced in, in more recent years. For example, even California has faced a severe drought. Uh, no state in India has faced a severe drought in, in, some, in a number of years. Uh, one doesn't know what, what the future might bring, but certainly uh, dr droughts are not um, high uh, you know, on the list of uh, risks that India faces. In fact, um, uh, India has demographics on its side. The median age, the median age in India today is just 28.4, making India one of the world's youngest countries. Uh, China, by, by contrast, is running into long-term structural constraints, including a shrinking and rapidly aging population. So I don't think um, uh, uh, demographics um, uh, you know, um, is an issue that, um, that bothers India because uh, India has a young, uh, has a youthful population that's driving consumption growth. It's driving uh, rapid economic growth. And, um, and, and uh, in the, in the, within the next um, 10 years, India will have um, about one fifth of the world's working age population, which, uh, which positions India to take over from China as, as the world's factory floor. Today, China is the world's factory. But given the rapidly aging and shrinking population in China, uh, India is positioned, is well positioned to take advantage of the fact that labor costs in India are lower than in China, that the demographics are on India's side, and the fact that most Western companies are trying to move production, or at least part of the production, out of China. So this is India's moment of opportunity that India should be seizing to become a manufacturing powerhouse for the world. Maybe I can just chime in as well. Uh, in terms of the uh, another aspect of the question, I think the, the future struggles with water uh, will obviously have an effect on the livelihoods of people in India. Uh, they probably won't have a direct correlation with the population size. But um, in addition to what Brahma said about the fact that India really has a young labor force, and you see countries like China and Japan and in Europe uh, suffering from uh, chronic shortages of labor uh, because of the aging population, uh, the good thing is, is that uh, that is also... Uh, complemented by the fact that India's increasing economic growth is at least slowing down the growth, the population growth rates, the the children per capita. Is that not correct, Brahma? Because I think uh, with respect to how India's future transpires, a continued explosive growth of population would obviously pose all sorts of other challenges, including putting everybody to work. But India's economic growth as really is a tendency and all developing countries uh, progressing up the economic ladder, the the rate of population growth decreases. You're, you're right, uh, Claudio. Um, India's population growth rate has uh, been on the decline for some time, and it's been declining actually quite sharply in urban areas. It's rare to see in urban India uh, families with more than two children. So without the government uh, imposing any um, any restrictions on, on family size. The fact is that uh, uh, most urban Indian families are pretty small. But on, on issue of water, I think, you know, uh, if, if you look ahead and, and look at the potential of solar part desalination, 
if that were to become economically viable, it will open up a huge source of water supply because India is a, is a country with a very long coastline and uh, solar power desalination could help to ease the water problems. The, the water problems are not severe in India at the moment, but, but I think without, without technology able to deliver solutions, uh, the water stress in India will become quite acute in the coming years. But I think the only, uh, the only possible answer could be um, besides um, solar power desalination would be uh, recycling of water, which again is a technology intensive process. Uh, and therefore it's, um, it's, it's, it's not a cheap process, it, you know, it's, it's costly. And again, if technology can lower those costs, then recycled water could uh, offer a answer to water stress in India uh, as it, you know, as it'll, it'll also be the answer in, in other water stressed um, countries and regions. Wow, look at all we learned from that question. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for asking it. Um, and I know some of our uh, students that are visiting have to go because of buses, so uh, just uh, be quiet. But thank you for coming and listening to our event. Thank you for joining this morning. Uh, we're going to go on to another question from our good friend, Marsha Kieran. Marsha asks this question. The free press seems to be under attack from the Indian government. The recent example of this was the Indian government's raids of the Mumbai BBC offices where they claim tax issues for the justification after they showed a film critical of Mr. Modi's ideas. Um, obviously not a good sign for democracy when <clears throat> the leaders have an issue with this. So Marsha's question is, does this concern you and how strong are the democratic forces in India? It's a good question because there's a certain narrative in the Western media that the Indian media is under some sort of pressure or attack. I as a scholar uh, see my duty as, you know, my duty, I see my duty uh, as, um, as someone who should be critiquing, cri uh, critiquing government policies. And I crit critique Modi government policies all the while. I publish in Indian newspapers. I've never, I've never, I've never faced any kind of pressure uh, no newspaper ever says no uh, to a piece critical of the government. Uh, the Indian press remains quite free. It's in fact, in some respects, in terms of foreign policy, um, if you look at the diversity of opinion, the Indian press offers more diverse opinions than the American mainstream media. If you look at the at you know the, at U.S. policy on uh, on Russia and you read the New York Times and the Washington Post, you don't get much, uh, you know, you get, you, don't, you get the establishment view most of the time, and only occasionally you see a differing um, uh, article on, on the US policy on Ukraine or Russia in, in the op-ed pages of the New York Times or the Washington Post, or even, or even the Wall Street Journal. But if you look at the Indian press, open any newspaper, you will see a much greater diversity of opinion on foreign policy and strategic um, issues. So the Indian press, by and large, remains uh, free. It, it's, um, it is, um, it's quite uh, vibrant. Uh, the Indian, um, the BBC issue is, uh, the, uh, I think, you know, it's important to keep it in mind what, what has happened with the BBC is that the income tax authorities have, you know, went to the office of the BBC in Mumbai to examine their tax records. This is all that has happened. And, and the tax authorities are entitled to, to examine the, the, the documents, the tax documents of any institution. My own think tank was similarly uh, scrutinized by income tax uh, authorities just a few months ago. 
there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that um, BBC is under attack. The BBC, BBC's largest audience in the world is where? In India. Uh, in fact, the BBC's largest funding comes from Indian advertisers. So the BBC is very much linked to India. Without India, there'll be no BBC left. So this narrative that BBC is under attack from Indian authorities is, uh, in, is in my view, uh, a very, very wrong um, you know, narrative because it's, it distorts what is happening. Thank you. We have time for just two more questions and I'm gonna go back to our virtual audience. Maybe both of you wanna comment on this. It says, how is the, is the caste system still affecting India's growth and prosperity? What are, are there limitations, things like that? What, what do you see with your experience there? Well, this, this, this uh, caste in, in all societies in the world in, in terms of uh, you know, of classes and differentiation between classes. So we have a similar, similar differentiation. Uh, it's, it's a caste system, but the caste system has loosened significantly in the sense that most people don't know each other's caste a, a, any longer. Uh, at least in urban India, caste doesn't play a role and people marry, you know, uh, across Cost divides, it's common. In fact, it's routine. Uh, um, people's caste doesn't count uh, when, they, when they seek employment. Factories or companies don't hire people based on their caste. Uh, in, in rural India, caste still uh, plays, plays a role because um, Traditionally, caste system was associated with, with occupations. So, for example, farmers belong to certain castes or um, soldiers belong to certain castes. So in rural India, that, um, that um, linkage between caste and occupation uh, still prevails to some extent, but even there, it's beginning to loosen. Overall, I would say that the caste system is becoming less of an issue in India and in the years to come, its, um, its role will further diminish. And I would just add that I think as, as an observer, uh, I would agree that what I've seen is similar in the uh, Sort of educated classes and in government and in business, uh, but you know ca caste related issues remain relevant. You know, in in a way that you know race is an issue in the U.S. still, and we've made a lot of progress, but obviously uh, we hear quite a lot today, even in the U.S. that the the and it's not just race, but any other forms of you know, discrimination against minorities and others. And I think a lot of those are embedded in sort of historical paradigms and our own form of a caste system. So uh, I think it still takes a lot of work to make progress, both here as we know, and also in India. Uh, but uh, but there's, there, it it's looms much less large on a day-to-day -day basis for someone like me going to India and observing how things go. Thank you for that comment on that. I will take one more question uh, back here. It's next. Yeah, I've been waiting for something to be said about trade between India and the West, particularly India and the United States. I, I would assume that with the, with the probable decrease in our trade with China, as we become uh, you know, less friendly with them over the next generation, that uh, this would be an opportunity for uh, exports from India to be replaced, replacing exports coming here from China. But uh, I wonder if you would comment Fan on that. Fantastic question. In fact, I really had wanted to touch on that issue uh, and I was worried about where we were going with time. And I was hoping somebody would ask that during the Q and A. If it's okay, I'll take a quick shot at it. Uh, 
you know, there's been a sea change in US India trade over the last 25 years from barely in the low billions, meaning a few billion dollars of overall trade. Today, the US and India are trading in the near 150 million, 150 billion dollars total of goods trade as well as services, uh, engineering services, IT services and such. Uh, the US experiences a trade deficit with India, uh, but not to the uh, degree that it does with, uh, with China. Uh, and it's been a huge ambition on the part of both the US and Indian governments to grow this trade because US-China trade is I think still a multiple of five uh, or at least of what US India trade is. I think US is India's biggest trading partner. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, China is also a big trading partner of India. Uh, and both of our countries experience a certain amount of dependency with respect to China. One of the critical areas of discussion that's been going on, I think, in the context of the Quad, as we mentioned earlier, as well as in other bilateral contexts is our mutual dependence, for example, on the, uh, the basic inputs to pharmaceutical products. I mean, obviously we import a lot of pharmaceuticals from China. We also import a, a many more pharmaceuticals from India, generic pharmaceuticals, uh, but we're both dependent in our manufacturing on the very dirty production process that China has had no problem expanding in China that creates the, the materials that ultimately go into our pharmaceutical products. So there's been a lot of discussion about how to become less dependent on China, given the security challenges and threats there. Uh, and one of the areas that was very important to me earlier in my career when I was in the Defense Department was breaking the ice on defense trade. Uh, that we had dribs and drabs that then ended up getting cut off because the U.S. would sanction India, uh, including in 1998 when India and Pakistan both did their nuclear tests. Uh, and we've seen, again, a sea change there where uh, India has purchased uh, tens of billions of dollars worth of defense articles, including C-130 aircraft and C-17 uh, aircraft and helicopters and there's co-production going on now. So some of these very same uh, helicopters and C-130s, parts of them are being made in, in India and the defense, US defense industries made a big effort to try to start figuring out ways of, of collaborating with Indian uh, manufacturers. And historically India's defense manufacturing has been a state run thing. They have state enterprises that do that, but the private sector is growing in that area and, uh, and US companies are looking for ways to collaborate there too. So trade is a big issue, it's very important. What you mentioned about displacing some of US production in China and moving it to India. Apple just opened a big manufacturing plant for the iPhone uh, and other companies are looking to do the same. Brahma, over to you. Uh, Claudia, uh, thanks for those. Um... Remarks, I think uh, you put it very well. Uh, I only wish to point out a couple of things. First, that um, booming US exports to India reinforce uh, bipartisan support in Washington for a closer partnership with New Delhi. India, after all, is one of the world's fastest growing economies uh, and has a huge market. Uh, President Biden just uh, day for yesterday, um, he, you know, he he issued a statement about Air India's historic um, deal with Boeing to buy more than 200 aircraft. And, and President Biden said this will create uh, more than 1 million jobs in the US. And it's a, it's a record deal uh, it's running into, uh, in fact, it's for 470 aircraft, you know, uh, you know both Boeing and, and Airbus aircraft. And, and it'll be a the total list price is going to be more than $100 billion. So this is one example of how trade between US and India is booming. And, and less, known, less known is the fact that uh, because of US sanctions on Iran uh, and, and the fact that India can no longer buy Iranian petroleum products, 
the U.S. has become a major source of crude oil and petroleum products for India. In fact, India is the largest destination for U.S. oil and petroleum exports. And, and, and these, these booming exports are helping to, to, de to, to uh, decrease the trade deficit that the U.S. has with India. Thank you. So thank you, Brahma, Claudio, for providing us with a deeper insight into the realities of India as Asia's new superpower. Thank you to all the students who joined us this morning and to members and future members who we hope will attend the rest of our upcoming IAF spring programs. I also want to give a special thanks to Gollum and Tangina and Taste of India for so graciously donating the excellent pre-event appetizers. Please visit their business in the Grand Traverse Mall. And on your way out, there's, there's plenty of food left. Uh, we've got some to-go boxes. So if you'd like to help yourself to those, um, you're very welcome to do so. To learn more about IAF, sign up for our e-news at tciaf.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel at TCIAF. And remember, the donation pail for the Academic World Quest competition is located just outside the auditorium. So please check it out. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.